David for the applicant in this matter. Mr. Mark Westman Smith appears for the respondent. Yes. Um, you will have seen that this is an oral permission hearing in relation to, strictly speaking, our application for permission to appeal against yes. Mr. Justice Lang's refusal of judicial review permission um, in respect of effectively one area of, of the matters in dispute in the underlying judicial review. Um, that, as you will have seen, concerns the legality of the government's food strategy, which was published yes. and produced in June of 2022. Just before you get into your stride, of course. could we say something which I hope helps everybody? Uh, as you would expect, um, but in fact we have um, read um, the materials that are submitted to the court. We're familiar with those materials. We have, of course, um, digested the skeleton arguments, their content, so we're familiar with that material as well. Um, and we have, of course, discussed the case before, before the hearing um, in order to um, share preliminary or provisional thoughts about the case as a whole. So that's all in the normal course of preparation. Uh, I say that because it's, I think it's important for everybody to know that that's been the court's approach. And it does have the consequence, we think, that we can take matters um, relatively crisply this morning. Um, of course, you'll both have the opportunity to make your submissions, your main submissions to us. We've got the background of the skeleton arguments, of course, by way of written submissions. Um, and we don't think, actually, that we're likely to need the full amount of allotted time this morning to enable a fair hearing to be um, achieved for everybody. I hope that's helpful. Um, my Lord, yes, up to a point. It depends how succinct you are. <laughs> well, no, I just go to the end and stop? Uh, I, um, well, I'm not going to say how succinct. Um, I'm simply going to say as succinct as you feel. You, you, you'll tell me if I'm... Um, if, I'm um, if, uh, if we yeah. feel that it's not succinct enough, we, no. might, we might suggest that. If we, if, if we think if the I, opposite, we might suggest that. But don't feel constrained. No, I don't feel constrained. But no. if, I, if I am going on too long, you'll let me know. We shall. Um, well, my lady... Um, the starting point, in one sense, is Mr Justice Holgate's judgment in the um, net zero strategy uh, decision of last year. Yes. Um, uh, I, uh, hear exactly what the court says. You, of course, have read it, and I'm sure you've read, in particular, the sidelined passages in it. Um, it, it um, in case you need it, is in tab 13 at page 249 of your legal materials bundle. Yes. Um, even before my Lord's um, helpful indication, I was only going to signpost really the points that we draw from it, and they are from those key paragraphs. Um, the, the judge sets out very helpfully um, in the early paragraphs 5 through 15 or so of, of his judgment, this is paragraph 229, um, the broad brush overview of the uh, Climate Change Act and its context within the UK's obligations for meeting the Paris Agreement. Um, I simply draw attention to the closing words of paragraph 12. Yeah. Where, where, as you'll have seen, um, the various mechanisms, including obligations to meet carbon budgets, um, the current, um, the furthest away statutory carbon budget is carbon budget six. You have that in the table at paragraph 10 on page 254. Um, and at the last sentence of paragraph 12 says this, it's common ground that the target in CB6 is substantially more challenging than those previously set. Uh, and you will have seen from the net zero strategy that that um, was then, and indeed even in the later documents, that remains the case. That is a challenging target. So that is the context in which this applicant is concerned about the way in which, in relation to its area of particular concern, which is food consumption and food production, yes. um, uh, uh, the Department of uh, 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 Environment, Food and Rural Affairs is, as it were, doing its bit um, within that context. Um, the judge then sets out, and I certainly won't guide you through this, starting at page 258, paragraphs 28 and following, um, other sections of, of, of the Climate Change Act, including at paragraphs 46 and 47, the paragraphs that provide the context for this judicial review, section 13 and section 14. Section 13, you'll see in a moment, Mr Justice Holgate, a continuing obligation, section 14, an obligation to produce a report from time to time, to periodically produce a report. Um, and then the other aspect of these um, summary paragraphs is in paragraph 50, you have this on page 263, where, where the judge introduces the Climate Change Committee, which is the government's statutory advisor. Um, he um, points uh, the reader at paragraph 50 to Schedule 1 of, of the uh, Climate Change Act, and he summarises some of the aspects of 
uh, the appointment process and so on in relation to the required expertise of the Committee on Climate Change. You see that in the indented section by letter C on page 263. Mm. You have that if you need it on page 57, page 57 of your uh, legal materials bundle, which say, just to signpost the destination for that, I'm sure you know where I'm going, um, they are par excellence, the kind of statutory advisor who would attract the protections of what the court said in uh, paragraph 9.4 of the Wyatt judgment, which I'll come to very briefly in due course. So, so that, that then is the, is the context, the overall context for the Climate Change Act provisions. What the judge then said, and I'll just highlight the points we draw from his judgment, right. paragraph 164 on page 285, no. the obligation on the Secretary of State under section 13 is a continuing one, and in one sense what, what this judicial review seeks to do is to explore um, what that means in the context of a framework in which um, uh, the government has chosen, doesn't need to have done it this way, chosen to produce a net zero strategy which then contemplated other policies. So what does it mean to be a continuing duty in that situation? Next paragraph is 165. Um, uh, the judge recognised, and, and we don't dispute, that what that means is that the proposals and policies, which is the, meat, the uh, bread and butter of section 13, um, will be at different stages of development and will evolve over time. There is nothing um, wrong in that process uh, and no point is taken, no point was taken in the net zero strategy litigation of a framework which in the case of the food strategy said we will produce a food strategy down the line. The question is if the government chooses to do it that way rather than producing, in other words, rather than producing firm policies and proposals, chooses to use a, 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 as it were, a signposting mechanism, what then is the consequence when we get to the place that's been signposted? 166, in a sense consistent with that, the phrase policies and proposals is deliberately broad. You'll see in a minute, a couple of minutes, how the food strategy was described within the net zero strategy. We say absolutely within that broadly understood framework around policies and proposals. And the judge drew the distinction between policies in that context and what the Supreme Court said in the Heathrow litigation about the meaning of policy, the more uh, 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 the precisely framed version of policy in relation to section uh, 5, 8 and so on of, of the Act. So mm -hmm. deliberately brought in, framed in a way that is absolutely and permissibly apt to, cut, to take and capture the kind of approach that was adopted here. Um, where, where then does that leave one in terms of the decision making process and what the judge then did and, and we adopt uh, his, his reasoning in this regard was to identify some things that he said were obviously material in that process and the critical point from our perspective in terms of understanding this is that these obviously material components were obviously material components in relation to the proposals and policies being relied on within the, in that case, section 14 report. Mm. They are not simply material considerations at the overall overarching uh, th section 13.1 will enable evaluation. They bite, and this is what the judge said, in relation to each policy proposal, and we say that's what matters here. Um, in, in, in that, as it were, in that, in that list of what's obviously material, paragraph 173, the judge identified the timescales, the timescale over which any particular policy proposal will, um, uh, 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 will deliver particular carbon savings is, is critical. It's an obviously material consideration in the evaluation. Um, at 189, he helpfully explained why these matters matter, as it were, and 189 and 190, um, he explained as the statutory purpose of this framework, the statutory purpose being, at least in part, and this is paragraph 190, um, to provide the mechanisms that allow the merits, realism, efficacy of the Secretary of State's climate change policies to be probed and evaluated, etc., by Parliament and the public. So this is not simply decision-making for its own sake, it's partly about public accountability. And that's why this judicial review, in exactly the same way as was the net zero strategy review, is not about the substantive content of the policy. We do not seek to draw the court into the merits of those policies. We simply seek to establish the proper legal framework that ensures these systems operate so that the public and parliament and non-governmental organisations and expert bodies and so on can hold uh, the government accountable for what it's doing or not doing in relation to tackling climate change. It's all about um, the proper separation of those constitutional powers. Um, the judge then at 194, the heading above 194, 
legal sufficiency of the briefing materials, and he then returned within that context to the obvious materiality framework with which we're familiar. This is paragraph two, page 292, within the sub-paragraphs of paragraph 202. He, he, he counterposed two alternatives. This is sub-paragraph 7, policies which were quantified. These are quantified carbon budget targets. So the starting point is quantified policies are needed, but it's also permissible up to a certain extent, and he didn't identify the limit of this, to have non-quantified assessments, qualitative targets, that's paragraph 9. That was permissible, provided the Secretary of State is properly informed. And in what you'll see in terms of the rubric here is that the food strategy was identified in the net zero strategy as an unquantified policy at that point. Um, those things then feed or fed in paragraph 204, critical paragraph, in my judgment, one obviously material consideration which the Secretary of State must take into account is the risk to the delivery of individual proposals and policies, the achievement of carbon budgets and the 2050 net zero target. This is necessarily implicit in the statutory scheme. In turn, this must depend on the relative contributions made by individual measures to achieving those targets. That is fundamental, and that's why the judge saw it that way, because if one is identifying a set of policies and proposals to achieve a numeric target by a particular date, which is the essence of the carbon budget framework, then a, simply a list of policies that says we're going to do A, B, and C tells the decision maker nothing and tells the public and parliament nothing. Without the background information, those obviously material matters, can't be scrutinised to say, are we, are we on track or, or are these in fact pie in the sky um, aspirational ideas? The 211 picks up the same point around quantification. Um, those we say are the critical elements in, in, in the framework. A um, little bit more detail, uh, but really expanding on those things. Paragraph 214, more work on the delivery risk point. And then at 215, the judge picks up the CCC point. The role of the CCC is to give advice as an expert body rather than to opine on questions of law, but nonetheless, the court should give considerable weight to their advice. December 2020, the setting of the CB6, the government proposal met near the CB6. The Committee on Climate Change said it should include a quantified set of policy proposals. So the judge put weight on the view of the CCC that policies needed to be quantified, although he obviously drew that in his own, um, in his own way, also from the statutory framework as an obviously material consideration. Then at paragraph 222, this is at the end, you'll be pleased to know, the judge returned to the question of the section 13 obligation being a continuing one made clear that all he was deciding was the nature of the Section 13 obligation at the point of producing the Section 14 report, and that he was leaving open for consideration uh, as it arose the question of how Section 13 was engaged in other situations. He, he made the point at the end of that paragraph, this is by letter C on page 272, <coughs> that, that questions of timing and so on might be matters for officials and the Secretary of State. He didn't determine that, and clearly his words at this point are, are simply, as it were, signposting for the future. Um, we say that leaves open and leaves undecided the issue in this case, and indeed signposts the need, we say, for that to be resolved. Mr. Um, North, can I just ask of course. you, sorry, have you finished your citation? Uh, um, please go, Lord. I, I, bearing in mind what you just said about paragraph 222, uh, I, I wanted to relate that back to what the judge said at paragraph 165 which you showed us a few moments ago. Yes. And it's on this point that the duty is a continuum. Yes. Um, might it be said that what the judge is saying in paragraph 165 is that it may be a continuing one, but in two distinct senses. One is the first half of paragraph 165, which is to recognize that proposals will evolve over time and be introduced and developed at different stages. And the second is that policies may need to be reconsidered mm -hmm. as circumstances change. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a, uh, an accurate way of looking at it? Yes, and I'm not even sure that's necessarily exhaustive of, right. the, of the way in which it might be a continuing obligation. Yes. Um, and we, we, just to be clear to the court, we, we are not seeking to exhaust <laughs> to fill the space either. Um, we, we come to the court with, with the food strategy example in, in, in frame, as it were, and you'll see in a second how the food strategy evolved through the net zero strategy. We are not seeking to 
by any means invite this court or any other court to give an exhaustive view on the Section 13 situations. When would they arise other than in this situation? Yes. There's another case, of course, I think seen, that deals with another government policy, it's aviation policy, which is um, mm -hmm. held up pending the outcome of this one. Um, I mean, I think all I would say, and this may not be directly answered to my Lord's question, is um, if, the, if the respondent is right here, then, then in fact, Section 13 almost ceases to become a continuing obligation. It collapses into being a snapshot obligation in the way that the Section 14 obligation has perhaps been identified. Um, so we, we say it can't be right that Section 14 only arises when you produce a net zero strategy and call it your Section 14 re report. Um, and, and once you're beyond that point, and that must be right in the light of the distinction between Section 14 and Section 13 obligations, the issue is then, when does Section 13 arise? And all we ask the court to look at is, did it arise here? Not filling the space. I think, sorry, it's a very long answer to your question. No, no, no. It may not even be an answer to your question. No, no, it, it, it's very helpful. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so re really, that then takes me, and I think I can do this briefly, not at least with the court's in indications, to quite how matters evolved here. And I just need to fill out a little bit um, what, what you've seen before. Did you say you wanted to go to Wyatt or not? Um, what, why, well, we can, we can look at why, um, uh, which looks familiar, it's page 308 within the bundle. Um, it's really <coughs> the, the principle in why it is, is Wyatt on appeal? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I, 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 I just don't know. No, I haven't heard anybody say that. <laughs> uh, we could perhaps check if, if it matters. Um, well, it, no, don't worry. Um, but in a sense, the, pa the passages of paragraph 9 uh, 4, uh, which are on page 316, um, are, are, were well founded in long standing authority um, uh, uh, and we say of general application so it would be surprising if, if these bits were um, yes. uh, 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 in dispute even if other aspects were mm. paragraph 9.4 it's on page 316 competent authority is entitled and can be expected that's the critical bit to give significant weight to the advice of an expert national agency with relevant expertise in the sphere of nature conservation such as natural England obviously this is speaking to that context, but we say the point is of wider application. It's not simply about nature conservation. Um, see a number of things. Um, the authority may lawfully disagree from and depart from such advice, but if it does, it must have cogent reasons for giving so. See the judgment, etc. So those are the two critical things. Um, significant weight has to be manifest, and, and if disagreement, then cogent reasons have to be manifest. Uh, and that, um, the court said elsewhere, in a sense, those kinds of explanations, I think this comes from Mott, those kind of explanations, in a way, are the quid pro quo for, for the court's deference to expert uh, uh, advisers. You have to explain how you deal with the expert advice, and in a sense, those things all fit together as, as a piece. And we say, as I signposted a moment ago, the CCC is par excellence in, within that space. So we would expect to see the Secretary of State giving significant weight to, and we would expect to see cogent reasons for departure from the advice of the CCC. Obviously, implicit in that is Secretary of State not bound by advice of expert advisor. Um, right. Just briefly then, the history of this, um, this uh, food strategy, just to take things in chronological order, um, you have in your bundle, start, supplementary bundle, I'm sorry, starting on page 9, the first of... Um, three um, points where we say there was clear CCC advice that engaged the Wyatt um, framework. So pa page nine is the, um, the CCC's progress report to Parliament in June of 2020. Within that, um, pa page 12, table five, left-hand page, Recommendations to the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Recommendation, and below that in the box, uh, bold, introduce an ambitious new policy framework to drive transformational change in agriculture and land use, including, and what you see is the link, the undisputed link between diet and land use. Um, so including, last bullet point, policies to encourage consumers to shift to healthier diets and reduce food waste, including public sector leadership and development of evidence-based strategy on diets target setting in the public and private sector to reduce food waste. So the CCC um, saw that, recommended it in clear and straightforward terms. In the same document, facing page in our bundle, 
you have a slightly teasing paragraph which starts with the words, this included, um, and, I, and I wanted to know what that's, where that came from. What that's a reference back to um, it is their 2019 net zero uh, report, so a previous CCC report, in which they set out, quote, their vision of the required transition. So their vision, CCC's vision of the required transition, included, second bullet, some societal choices that lead to a lower demand for carbon intensive activities. For example, an acceleration in the shift towards healthier diets, etc. And that's all explained. I don't dwell on the detail of all of that. I don't seek to explain for how all of that works because the CCC's advice is what it is and it stands <coughs> on its own. You then have um, page 15, just sticking with the sequence, December 2020, the sixth carbon budget um, advice. So this was the advice given by the CCC um, to the effect that we needed to amend the previous 80% target within the Climate Change Act to become a 100% target. That advice was followed, at least in relation to that um, high-level as aspect of it. Page 18 and 19 within here, within their list, and you've only got extracts, but I think they're clear enough on their own. Page 18, first bullet, um, reducing demand for carbon-intensive activities. And then the first sub-bullet, reduced demand around 10% of emission savings in our balanced pathway, so that's their modelling, comes from changes to reduce demand for carbon intensive activities. Particularly important in our scenarios are an accelerated shift in diets away from meat and dairy products, reductions in waste, and so on. And then they actually go into the travel issues as well. Um, so that was their clear advice. And then the facing page, page 19, um, second bullet under the heading agriculture and land. The last sentence, policies are also needed to cut food waste and encourage a reduction in consumption of meat and dairy. And then the final, in the sequence, page 115, it is, <coughs> is their, again, progress report to Parliament in this time, June 2021. And then within that, it's now getting slightly repetitive, 117 in your uh, bundle, table A5, recommendations for DEFRA. Um, Left-hand column is headed agriculture and food, and the second bullet in there repeats uh, in similar terms the advice that they have given before. That then fed into the net zero strategy document, or rather didn't fit into the net zero strategy document, but we'll, we'll see in how it went in a moment. Um, that, that document is at um, supplementary bundle page 26. Just in terms of the structure of this document, the contents page, page 27, we see um, chapter 3, reducing emissions across the economy. So this was the section 14 report that discharged the section 13 exercise that was then declared unlawful, not quashed, but declared unlawful by Mr Justice Holgate. Subsection 3.6, natural resources, waste and F gases. We have that extracted, starting at your page 28. And this captures a number of different things, um, but they, in terms of the hierarchy of headings, if you go with, within that document to page uh, 36 of your bundle, each chapter here started with um, introductory discussion, and, and then the structure of this document was repeated in each, each chapter, and in each chapter then has, as this one does, page 36, a heading policies and proposals. And within policies and proposals, agriculture, forestry, and other land uses, AFOLU. And within AFOLU, on page 37, top of the page, agriculture. So we have the agriculture component of the AFOLU policies and proposals within chapter 3.6. Within that, we have a series of things, paragraph 28, 29, and so on, each of which starts with very similar language, 28, government will, 29, we will, over the page, we will, etc. Mm -hmm. And then we drop to 33. The government's upcoming food strategy will support the delivery of net zero, nature recovery, and various other things. And then it explains a little bit of detail. So the food strategy will support the delivery. So that is identified um, as within the section on policies and proposals alongside other policies and proposals. Um, we, we gave the court the document, um, a, 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 the previous document in the bundle, yeah. um, which we now realise might have um, sort of benefited from a bit more explanation. You've now got the explanation in documents we sent through yesterday. Yeah. That was a witness, sorry, an exhibit to a witness statement from the uh, Bayes civil servant who had led that process. Yeah. It is just worth, if you don't mind for a moment, um, 
trespassing into that, that witness statement to, for her explanation of the document I'll just take you to. Right. You um, have that. Um, I came with a letter yesterday. I understand from your card. So we, have, we have got the letter. You have um, got the letter. That's really helpful. I've had it electronically, and now we've got it printed. You've got it. Um, so I only need to take you to very short sections. Yes. Um, what you have... The most important bits you're, are... are you take, you're taking us to the, the bits that are agreed to Uncontroversial. Admissible, yeah. I'm not even sure how contra controversial the other bits are, but let me take you to the uncontroversial bits right. anyway. Uh, page um, 43, internal pagination, paragraphs 131 to 132. She explained the process of submission of documents to the Minister for sign-off of the Net Zero Strategy. At 132, she lists annexes provided to the Minister. 132C, she says, Annex C, list of policy proposals and policies that deliver direct emission savings towards our carbon budget and NDC as at 15th of October. Yes. That was a little bit before. That's the point she's about to make. Footnote 14. Footnote 14. C, paragraph 132C. For a finalised list, list of net zero strategy policy, proposals and policies, Exhibited, exhibited to this statement, SJ13, the list provided Annex C to the Minister was in effect a very advanced but still working draft, as at 15 October 2021, of proposal policies in the NZZ which delivered direct emission savings towards our carbon target from an NDC, etc. Line down, the list referenced in paragraph 132 is the final version based on work done to align the analysis, etc. And then at paragraph 161, she returns to the same point. This is page 52 internal separately so, so this is after after the net zero strategy has been published the heading above 160 is confirmation of projected emissions etc she says at 161 separately to assist with the ongoing policy development and delivery process to meet our allegedly carbon budgets my team and nzs analysts compiled two lists after the nzs was published which i exhibit a final list of all the quantified and unquantified proposals policies in the NZS, which includes the state of their quantification or not at the time of publication, SJ13. So even after the NZS was, was dusted and published before Parliament, work is still going on to, tie, to tidy up the documentation. And that then, so the other aspect you get from all of this, but I can't believe this is controversial, is that that came from a process that involved all of the government departments, and unsurprisingly, DEFRA took the lead in relation to Chapter 3, uh, 6, because that's the DEFRA materials. So, I can't believe that in itself is controversial. Um, that then takes us back to SJ13, which you have in your supplementary bundle at page um, uh, 20. Yes. Um, so this was the exhibit to that witness statement. Exhibit SJ13, list of proposals and policies in the net zero strategy. Chapter three, proposals and policies. And then the table. Left-hand column, chapter. Middle column, proposal or policy. Right-hand column, quantification status. And then you see each of the chapters is helpfully um, numbered by reference to the net zero strategy chapters, as you'd expect. On page 21, we hit chapter 3, 6 by the lower hole punch. Um, and we hit agriculture as we go through that on page 22 towards the top of the page. And then within the agriculture, the last but one entry on page 22, three, six natural resources under the proposal policies table, agriculture, the government's upcoming food strategy will support the delivery of net zero, etc. So DEFRA contributing a, a, gr a great number of quantified targets, but the food strategy is an unquantified. Exactly right, my lady. Exactly right. Exactly right. So no, 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 no complaint of illegality at that point in that sign use of what I'm calling a signposting mechanism. The question is what happens then when you produce your food strategy. We say, um, as a matter of the pure process, that leaves the net zero strategy, sorry, the food strategy as a proposal or policy, just in terms of the structure of the materials, mm -hmm. or, or look at it the other way, as a collection of policies and proposals. I'm not going to dance on that particular pinhead. Mm -hmm. um, but that is the way in which it's described throughout these materials, and, and, and un, un, unambiguously so. It was seen in that way. It was seen as part of the overall package of Section 13 proposals and policies and presented as such in the Section 14 report. Mr. Wolf, can I ask you, of course, if that right-hand column had, at that time, said quantified, what would have followed on your side? Uh, 
um, uh, it's quite hard to see how that would have been possible. Um, uh, I only say this, I mean, the word could have been written, <laughs> um, but, but um, given that the policy hadn't been produced at that stage, it's no, hard to see. The, suppose the policy had been produced. Ah, if the policy had been produced. Yeah. Um, uh, well, then, then um, uh, we, we would have expected to see the policy at that point with quantification errors. Um, and had, if there had been a policy produced at that point with qualify, uh, sorry, quantified policy to propose it, the claim, this claim wouldn't be here. I mean, subject to the Wyatt point um, uh, and so on. It, it's, it's, the, it's the deferring for later, which particularly going through the unquantified gateway, that, that's the problematic element. Because, because um, other aspects of all of this can be uh, interrogated, other quantified policies and proposals and so on, which are specified in more detailed terms, can be interrogated. And that's why we, we, we recognise what Mr Justice Holgate said. You can have policies and proposals that are very detailed. And some of the policies and proposals of the net zero strategy were as specific as, you know, we will amend this regulation to change the insulation requirements or whatever it might be, something very specific. We will ban the sale of new um, uh, of, of petrol cars by a certain date, very specific things that can be quantified and people can argue about the quantification, but that's the point here. No idea at this point what the food strategy is going to include, and that's the, that's the vice. But there's a, there's a spectrum, clearly. Um, uh, but it wouldn't be an... It wouldn't, well, if, if that had been the answer at that point, there would have been um, explanation around it. I, I don't think, unless I'm misunderstanding my Lord's question, that could have occurred in a vacuum to say... Um, here, is, here is a quantified version, or at least if it had, you would then be looking for the quantification in the food strategy, so the point would arise in, in, in a different way at the same place. I don't think that changes the, the end answer. And, and it, doesn't, it certainly doesn't deal with, so the reason that the net zero strategy fell, or was declared unlawful, um, what was um, in relation to the unquantified policies and the quantified policies, the lack of the delivery risk information for the Secretary of State and in the report, and the lack of the timing information. So that would have been the case, whatever the word was in that right-hand column. Um, um, so, so, Lord Mullaney, that, that's, that's how it um, works in terms of the substance. That's how it was described. Um, as it happens, that, that led to the um, uh, CCC's report at page 44 yeah. of your bundle, which was their October 21 um, assessment of the Net Zero strategy. <coughs> so page 46... Um, the heading on 46 is remaining differences and ambition from the CCC pathway. Three paragraphs down, another clear difference, dot, dot, dot. The last sentence of that um, paragraph just above the lower hole punch. However, the strategy has nothing to say on diet changes away from meat and dairy or on limiting growth in flying. And then the same point, two paragraphs further down. In agriculture, it appears to come from improving productivity or innovations of the likes of animal health. The exact plan is currently unclear in the absence of a specific strategy for decarbonising agriculture and land use. And then in the same document on your page 47, um, last box of, on that page, last but one bullet, a government food strategy is being planned, which needs to set out clear targets for the food system's impact on health, nature and climate. This should include the role of consumers and the wider supply chain. So the CCC specifically takes a point after the production of the document on the point on which it's been advising. You then have the food strategy itself. This is in four bundle, one, six, page 163. So that the reader um, enthusiastically looks to find the answer to those questions. How is that all being done in the food strategy? Um, page 163, within that document at 167, you have the foreword. There's a brief mention of methane emissions at 168 it's in the context of feed additive, the last paragraph on 168 in the Secretary of State's forward. And then, then you have page 169, just to pick up the words used, the strategy responds to the review, and it, that's the Dimbleby review, and includes policy initiatives to boost health sustainability. I think that must be the entry point into what we're looking at next. Hey, paragraph over the page, paragraph 9, our objectives for this strategy are to deliver, and there are three objectives, that matters in terms of where we're going in a moment. Second bullet, second objective, a sustainable dot, dot, dot. And then ten, to achieve these objectives we seek to, and then the fourth bullet, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and the environmental impacts of the food system in line with our net zero commitments and biodiversity targets, repairing the risks from a changing climate. 
So that is, in a sense, simply more signposting, more signposting in terms of what, what we intend to do rather than anything actually explaining what, what the content of that will be. We get a little bit more on key measures, starting on 172. The individual objectives are picked up paragraph by paragraph. So we go to paragraph 17 on 173. Objective 2, which was the sustainable, etc., food system. The second bullet there, we will publish a land use framework in 2023 to ensure we meet our net zero and biodiversity targets and help farmers, dot, dot, dot. That's, that's as close as we get to getting any detail. There's then a touch on farming practices, just for completeness, on page 177, page paragraph 1.2.4. Second line, you see mention of farming innovation. And then the fourth line, middle of the line, this will help farmers to identify and develop low carbon farming practices. So there's a little bit there on low carbon farming practices. That's the extent of the mentions, I think, of um, measures that might contribute to tackling climate change. So if one looks at the food strategy and says, what do we get from the net zero strategy signpost? That's, I think, as much as we get. And, and we say uh, the, the, the illegality crystallised at that point. Um, <clears throat> that led, I'm not going to grind you through all the, um, the, 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 the uh, uh, litigation materials, but just in terms of the timing, there was a little bit of a point on timing. Page 48 of your bundle, supplementary bundle, I'm sorry, is the pre-action protocol letter. So this was written on the 7th of July, the food strategy having been June. So 7 July, pre-action protocol letter, that raises, well, overtaken by events, obviously, but that raises points about section 13, section 14, and the CCC. Going back through those, but that was prior to the net zero strategy judgment, which came on the 15th of July. So the 15th of July obviously um, shed further light on the third, section 13 and 14 obligations. Um, you then have um, the government's response page 64, so this then comes after, this is now the 5th of August of 2022, so this is after we all have the benefit of the Colgate, and nothing is said there to the effect that, nothing is said there or anything since, to the effect that the food strategy somehow drops away or, or is changed or its status is affected by what Mr Justice Colgate said, um, and that pattern continues. Um, our claim, um, the underlying judicial review claim, the statement of facts and grounds is in your core bundle at page um, one, two, four. Within that, you have the grounds of claim starting at page one, the relevant paragraphs at 141. Uh, and should we, just, should we just look at those? Of course. Um, a moment. Paragraph 44, well, the, the ground is failure to discharge the section 13, 14 duties. Paragraph 44, last sentence, um, asserts that the defendant was under those duties when compiling, publishing the, when publishing the food strategy. Is this what's now become ground five? In the um, well, it's, uh, yes, it's ground five in the appeal against, yes. So that's in terms of the, the, the labelling, but it remains, but, but those were the grounds of challenge to the judge's refusal of permission. Yes. If permission were granted, I yep. think we would go back to here. If, if I'm, if I'm, um, if I'm, yes. Um, so, but did the, the grounds replicate? Yes. Are replicated yes, yes. in the appeal. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. That's that's exactly right. Paragraph forty-five, mm -hmm. in terms of the illegality, unlawfully failed to discharge, the nature of which was elucidated in the net zero case. We'd have that been by that point. In particular, he failed to quantify the effect on GHG emissions of those policies, or to assess the delivery risks associated with those, etc. So that's the substantive section thirteen point. A bit of evidence points there. Um, and, and then ground three, paragraphs 48 and 50. Alternatively, in any event, such advice was an obviously material consideration on conventional public law principles as reviewed in Wyatt, given the CCC as expert national agency, etc. Um, 49 says no, no uh, significant consideration. And then 50, even if there were now revealed to be some evidence of consideration, then the defendant could still only have lawfully departed for cogent reasons, etc. That's the, that's the Wyatt point. That's the second part of the Wyatt point. So that that is the, is the essence of the of the challenge. Um, 
I won't go through what, what um, uh, Sir Ross Cranston did at, um, uh, on the papers. I'll simply go, if I may, to what the judge, um, uh, uh, Mr Justice Lang, did, or the Lady Justice Lang, on the uh, appeal. Mr Justice Lang, um, her um, uh, order is at paragraph 40 of your bundle. Sorry, paragraph 37 of your bundle. Uh, judgment is at paragraph 38. The relevant paragraphs are at para page 40, paragraphs 15 through 18. She says this. Let me just touch on what she said, because that's where we say the appeal bites. Um, she says, the Secretary of State who fulfills the functions and duties of the Secretary of State for business, energy, and industrial strategy. Um, we said that's not a complete um, answer or complete picture. Carbon budgets are set by Secretary of State's base relate to the whole economy. That's true. Um, but not an answer. They're comprised of a single overall budget for period not divided up by section department. That's true, but not an answer. Only the Secretary of State is in a position to perform the Section 13 duty by considering the effect of all proposals across all sectors. But the difficulty with that is that that's not the totality that doesn't exhaust the obligation in Section 13. Because as you've seen, Section 13 does involve the overall consideration in some sense, because it involves the will enable question that Section 13 one asks, but it also requires consideration at the policy proposal level of the obviously material considerations. See Mr Justice Holgate. Other sections of state issuing their own departmental strategies at any particular time are not in a position to perform the Section 13 duty. Well, if you frame the Section 13 duty or if you only focus on the overarching um, uh, will enable question, that then that might be right, but that is not exhaustive of what Section 13 involves, see Mr Justice Holgate. Mm. And, and particularly when one understands the continuing nature, um, what does that mean, we rhetorically say, um, uh, uh, in the circumstances in between the periodic set-piece exercise that the net zero strategy process ma manifested? Um, but then, top of page 41, the strategy adopted by the defendant did not contain the policies and proposals for government for meeting carbon budget under the 2008 Act. No, it didn't contain all the policies and proposals, but that is to collapse the Section 13 exercise into something you only do at the point of doing the Section 14 exercise. My view is not arguable that Section 13 imposes a duty on Section State for Bays to assess all departmental proposals for their potential contribution prior to their adoption by the ministers, whenever that may be. We are not arguing that case. That is, that is a much bigger vista than we seek to argue on. We are not saying whenever they're thinking of a policy. We're not saying that if a department wakes up one morning and says, let's think about a policy for X or Y, that suddenly engages Section 13, um, Section 14, let alone. But in a situation, or in this situation, where the government has chosen to frame the net zero strategy in the way that it did, and signpost put off, if you like, the food strategy element, we say that situation, or that type of situation, does engage Section 13 in relation to the evaluation that needs to be undertaken. Do you say that, in substance, the food strategy was therefore incorporated by reference into the net zero strategy? Um, well, um, well um, it wasn't that sort of, I'm, I'm trying to think of my last question. Um, it, it, I mean, yes, but um, maybe my, uh, my lack of imagination, but I would normally understand incorporated by reference to mean that I can look to the other document to find the, the answer yes. to my question at the time. Yes. And that clearly wasn't right, if that's no. how you see the, those words. No. So it was, it was, um, it was explicitly, uh, in one sense, the, 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 the plan to make or the proposal to make a food strategy was undoubtedly one of the net zero strategy policies and proposals. What we say is that when you then make the food strategy, that is the seeing through of that exercise. And if you haven't done the obviously material quantification, timescales, risk delivery bit, which you haven't here, then that is left hanging. And that's why we say this is an example of that particular kind of case. And it might, just to go back to my Lord, Lord Justice Singh's earlier question, if you, I mean, this is not this case and we don't need to answer this question, but if you, um, let's imagine that one of the policies and proposals in the net zero strategy had been quantified, there had been full information on risk delivery, which there wasn't, that was why we, uh, we uh, that case was won. Um, had that all been there, and then two years later that policy or proposal was revisited, there's an argument about whether Section 13 would apply at that point, a revisiting case. Um, we're not a revisiting case, we're a leftover case, see what I mean, yes. from my, my crude attempt to 
classify. No, we're not trying to argue the full. We're not trying in this case to argue the full space of section 13, and that's I think. Mr. Justice Holgate was, was right to signpost in Power 222 what he did, which is to say this opens up a series of, of issues. Um, but those issues, the two examples I give and potentially others, um, they, they are occurring, have occurred here and in the aviation case, and um, we say it's plainly foreseeable they will occur in other instances, and indeed arguably they do in relation to the CBDP, which has come since, um, going forward to 2050 and so on. So this is, a, this is a potentially ongoing um, issue. It's not said that this claim is academic in any sense. This issue will arise again um, because this, because the government continues to use and entirely permissibly this sort of uh, 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 evolution, evolving framework of, of policies and proposals. And when the food strategy is published, and you say Section 13 bites, yes. who has those uh, duties? Bearing in mind that the Secretary of State is is one indivisible Secretary of State. Yes. Um, but who has the obligation under Section 13? Well, our our, to consider pr our how primary case, our case was, is was brought in relation to the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. His 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 name is on the document, if you like, um, because what what matters at that point is the is the um, uh, 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 taking into account of the quantification, the time scale, and the delivery risk involved in that. Are, are we are we here? Well, let me hypothesise. Yeah. Let me say the Secretary of State said I don't want to do dietary change. Yes. I don't want to do what the CCC says. Here's my reasons not to. I want to do something else. Yes. But the Secretary of State then needed to engage with um, uh, 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 what are the quantification, delivery timescales, and risks of the alternative that I'm uh, contemplating, if that's, if that's the road. We don't know. I'm just speculating yes. that that's the road that one might go down. Um, and the obvious candidate for that is the person who produces the food strategy. But if it's said, well, only the Secretary of State for Bayes, now the new title, sends, I think it is, um, can do that job because of the allocation internally. Well, so be it. That Secretary of State needs to do that exercise and have and publish that information. Um, but at the moment, that Secretary of State, perhaps even saying that Secretary of State may be inept, but the Secretary of State holding that office is not a party, after all. No, and... You've seen, you've seen we tried to make them a party and we were told we couldn't have them as a party and we didn't need them as a party because this Secretary of State could answer for the government, which in a sense is, yes. goes back to my lady's so, um, yes, point, which the is same point, yeah. they can all answer for each other. I don't mean that in any crude yes. sense. Mm. Um, so so in, our, in, our, in our submission, that doesn't take you anywhere in the end. No, no. Um, because, because what matters, I mean, it, um, it's a matter for the inter internal mechanics of government. Um, and, and just to go back to the production of the food strategy, I mean, what you... What you what I wasn't allowed to show you is the materials which explain how civil servants, I mean, unsurprisingly, you didn't have a team of people in bays, as it was, sitting there writing policies about agriculture or aviation. I mean, no surprise, they were, they were working with the departments and yeah. DEFRA took the lead on chapter 3.6, no surprise. And if you look at, there's a flowchart at the back of those materials that says lead responsibility going forward for chapter 3.6, DEFRA. I mean, that's not a, it's not a revelation. Um, uh, uh, so that would be most obviously where the thinking would be, because what matters is the thinking. Um, I mean, it, 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 even when um, the the the, um, the net zero sector of straight state, whatever they're called at the time, um, comes to do the overall analysis, pulls together all the numbers and says, does this reach 100%? Well, then they're the one who's pulling all the, the numbers together, and that's right. But um, and at that point, if they're doing it in a section 14 um, snapshot they have all that on the table in front of them, tabled a bit like SJ13 only with more stuff in it because that was deficient, um, and they do the exercise. But at the point where you produce the food strategy, which is your leftover from the net zero strategy, somebody, we say most obviously the DEFRA Secretary of State, has to have that information and publish it. Because that's otherwise, I mean, the counter to that approach simply is that, um, uh, I mean, the logical extension would be you can have a net zero strategy or equivalent, which just said, we're going to produce a load of policies down the track, here are their titles, um, they all get produced, and at no point do you get the scrutiny of quantification, delivery risk, or, or time scale. That can't be right. And if you only, that's point one, point two, if you only do that exercise at the next time you do a section 14 exercise, which is one carbon budget later because of the way section 14 works, then you've collapsed the continuing duty into, into a, a snapshot, snapshot duty. And that can't be right. So we, we absolutely, just to reassure the court, we don't seek to explore the space wider than is absolutely necessary, but we do say the judge was at least arguably, unless the 
first threshold, arguably wrong, to, to uh, refuse permission for judicial review. Um, see, that gets us, this is a rolled up, I think, hearing. It gets us into the point where we say, um, unashamedly, the point of the two points, one about the applicability of Section 1314, one about the CCC and Wyatt, um, are both arguable um, for judicial review purposes, and that's why we ask this court to grant judicial review permission. Mr. Wolf, do you accept that when one is considering Section 14 of the Act, the relevant Secretary of State is what was Bayes? Yeah, Sens, I think. Sens now. Yeah. Um, well, much more obviously so, because they're the one who's doing the, the composite exercise. Um, uh, but but um, I mean, that does leave a slightly... Um, I mean, I recognise Section 14 is a bit more, a bit more nuanced here, because, because um, uh, one of uh, what Mr Justice Holgate rightly explained was the way in which... Um, uh, and I showed you the paragraph. The, section, the exercises are partly designed to inform the public, parliament, NGOs and so on, who can scrutinise, for better or for worse, what the government's... That's the whole point of this process, is yes. to, government says it's going to do this, we can, we can challenge them, we can ask questions in Parliament and so on. Whether, whether you call that publication exercise a Section 14 exercise in relation to the quantification, risk delivery assessment and so on, or you call it a freestanding publication, it's, it's perhaps semantic. But I, I, I take my Lord's point. Right. Can I also ask you, because you, you mentioned, you touched on this, that it may not matter at the end, I, I have no idea. That you mentioned a procedural issue about possibly adding the Secretary of State to sense. That, that, uh, in, in other contexts with which I'm familiar, particularly national security cases, yeah. I frequently come across claims which are brought against typically the Secretary of State for the Home Department and the Secretary of State for the Foreign Commonwealth and <laughs> Development. So, so, speaking for myself, I don't see any problem in principle or in practice with naming two secretaries of state as being the relevant dependents to judicial review proceedings. But are, are you saying that somebody has, has said yeah, that yes. a problem here? Yes, 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 they did. Um, so, so um, uh, uh, we, 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 um, we sought to add a secretary of state. Um, uh, and Is it the, Sir Ross Cranston, who said Yes, and, and then Lord, um, Mr. De Rotham still gives the, the steps prior to that, but, but um, Ross Cranston pushed it back, and then uh, 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 Mr. Justice Lamb did the same. Um, so I've got the yeah, wrong I mean, it's, um, so, this, so the original request, our request, just to pick up my Lord's yeah. point, sorry, I will find this in a second. Um, um, I'm, I'm looking at page 79, yeah. where Sir yeah, Ross like Cranston that. said it was not necessary. Yes. It d doesn't seem to suggest there's any problem in principle or practice. No, no. no. I mean, I, I mean uh, yes. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's rather the opposite of saying there's a problem. Mm. Uh, mm. Say it's not necessary to do it. Um, but in any case, um, we're, we're conducting a, a hearing on permission to appeal, formally speaking. But of course, that in the judicial review context. And yes, and this court's jurisdiction, I apprehend, would extend to, um, if need be, to, to adding a party which could be the Secretary of State for different departments. Well, uh, we, 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 um, as you've seen, uh, I, 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 I appreciate, um, we, we, we did that in response to the proposition, uh, the response to us, which was that, um, the right and only Secretary of State to discharge this legal obligation was the Bay Secretary of State. We said, well. Um, uh, in which case, add them. Um, we have we the, the applicant claimant have no difficulty with that. No, I don't you, think that, as my lord's exploring. I'm sorry, I'm being no, a you're, slow. You're, as it were, entirely relaxed about. We're entirely relaxed about it. Exactly, exactly right. Um, uh, uh, um, yes, I think that must be right. We, we only went down that road because because that was the response. If 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 we've got the wrong secretary, say, well, so be it. We'll we'll add the other one. But I don't think I think the question behind all the questions is you're not precluded from doing that. Certainly no. for the reasons you you've given, my lord. And, and, I, and, I, and I just to pick up the point you made about the, what's formally before this court, I mean, we, it's obviously up to this court what it, what it does entirely, but we would hope that this court either grants judicial review permission or not, rather than, I, don't, I, mean, I can't imagine anybody wants more slices of this particular process, having got to a three-court 
uh, Court of Appeal at this stage. And your invitation to us ultimately is to grant permission to apply for judicial Exactly action. right, exactly yeah. right. And, and we're leaving ahead, of course, and you've got to listen to the argument that you would possibly and maybe presumably couple that with a request that the matter be retained in this court. I think that's agreed. Yes. I think, I think the respondent uh, defendant says um, exactly that. And both uh, parties if, if, if you grant permission. That, if that were the path that this court, in the light of all submissions made this morning, chose to follow, uh, then you're agreed that, that the, the case should stay here. I, I think, yes. Well, yeah. And I think I've heard my learned friend's um, uh, um, mm. uh, skeleton argument um, yes. that comments on various things by saying we haven't yet got to the evidence stage, no, so no. we anticipate there's, there's stuff to come. Of like. course. Well, there would, if we did take that course, if we did, I stress if, um, then there would have to be appropriate direction. Of course, of course. Um, I'm just one moment, if I may. I'm, I'm told that um, uh, the searches behind me haven't revealed an appeal in Wyatt in the meantime. Oh, that's very good of you to know. <laughs> Perhaps actually the power of the in-court no, well, or two the members, input court mobile phone. Two, two members of this have an interest in that instant um, answer. Question. <laughs> Legal question. Um, thank you. Would, uh, thank you for West law at least, anyway. Those who checked, thank you very much. Well, unless I can assist further, those are our submissions. Thank you very much. <coughs> Yes, oh, sorry, sorry. Hang on. <coughs> my lords, my ladies, this um, application for permission to appeal raises the key question. Uh, which is um, whether or not Section 13 was engaged at the time of the adoption of the food strategy by the Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. That goes to the scope of Section 13 and its construction. That requires an analysis of the language of Section 13 and its statutory context. Now, your Lordship is uh, very familiar with that statutory context, and I don't want to um, try your patience, but can I just, through going back to the Friends of the Earth or the Net Zero Judgment, draw out a, a number of high-level points? And that, so that's the Authorities Bundle, tab 13. And it's the section uh, dealing with the Climate Change Act, beginning at uh, paragraph 28. Yes. And at, at paragraph 28, uh, it, it identifies part one as dealing with carbon targets and budgeting. So that's the part in which section 13 um, sits. And it's important to understand what the carbon budgets are in order to understand the duty under section 13. And carbon budgets are set under section 4, which is dealt with at paragraph uh, 32, and you'll be familiar with um, that section. And Section 8, which is at paragraph 34, um, requires, uh, at subsection 2, the carbon budget for a period uh, must be set with a view to meeting the target in section 1, the net zero target, uh, and the requirements of uh, section uh, 5. And section 5 is the section uh, that allows, uh, it's dealt with at paragraph 33, uh, it requires the annual equivalent of the figure set for carbon budget 3 is at least 34% lower than 1990, and it allows uh, particular targets to be set for carbon budget um, periods. And then over the page at paragraph 36, 
uh, the attention is drawn to section 10, which sets out the matters to be taken uh, into account by the Secretary of State when uh, making decisions under part one in relation to carbon uh, budgets. And one can see uh, the very broad spectrum of considerations that have to be taken uh, into uh, account. With that, um, I'll go to section 13 itself, which is uh, set out at paragraph uh, 46 of the judgment. And at, paragraph, at section 13.1 um, is the duty in question, and it requires the Secretary of State to prepare uh, such proposals and policies as the Secretary of State considers will enable the carbon budgets uh, that have been set under this Act to uh, be met in subsection 2. Uh, referring back to the target in section one and any targets under section uh, five. And <clears throat> section 29 of the uh, Climate Change Act sets out the net UK, uh, the definition of net UK uh, emissions. And this is described by Mr. Justice Holgate in paragraph uh, 29 of his judgment. Um, the target in section one one is set by reference to the net UK uh, carbon account. Uh, the account shows the amount of net UK emissions target of targeted GHGs over the period C section uh, 29, uh, less the amount of carbon units credited, plus the amount of carbon units debited in the same uh, period. And that's what we're dealing with when looking and construing uh, section 13 uh, 1. The carbon budgets are uh, nationwide, they're UK-wide. They provide an overall budget uh, which isn't broken down into sector or departmental uh, areas. And if one turns forward in the judgment to um, paragraph 202, uh, Mr Justice Holgate sets out the statutory uh, context and the overarching context is dealt with by Roman 1 uh, to 5 <coughs> as I've just touched upon and uh, at, at Roman 10 um, it's, it, it deals with um, carbon <coughs> budgets and the 2050 targets relating to the whole of the UK economy and society and not to sectors uh, achievement of those targets requires a multiplicity of policy measures across uh, addressing the UK as a whole, individual sectors and factors failing, uh, falling within section 10 uh, 2. The measures will be operative at different points in time. Some will apply in isolation and others in combination. Whether an overall strategy will enable the statutory targets to be met depends upon the contribution which each policy or interrelated groups of policy is predicted to make to the cumulative achievement of those targets. And that's so would you expect an, a, a particular policy <coughs> for one sector to at least enable somebody to identify what contribution it's predicted to make to the cumulative achievement of the targets? When an assessment is made of the um, whether or not there is sufficient proposals and policies to meet that cumulative target, those considerations identified by Mr Justice, Holgate, um, timescales, risk to delivery, etc., uh, need to be factored in. But how can they be unless you've got some idea of what it's predicted to contribute? Um, th that is a question of the operation of the Secretary of State making that judgment and pooling together the necessary information. It doesn't require that information necessarily to, to, to exist in a policy in another department. It does require that other department to provide the information in order to be able to make uh, the judgment at the time that judgment is made. So, yes, but forgive me for interrupting. But suppose, quite properly, as I understand Mr. Justice Holgate's judgment, the Secretary of State, who's compiling the overall assessment, says, well, I've consulted that department, I've 
consulted another department, I've consulted DEFRA, the first two departments have given me quantified policy statements. So I'm already able to make my assessment of what's predicted is going to be their contribution to my overall target. DEFRA have said to me, for perhaps perfectly understandable reasons, that we haven't yet finalised our policy. Can you give us 12 months, please? So this Secretary of State says, fine. So I'll say in my net zero strategy, uh, there's going to be one in 12 months' time. So in 12 months' time, when DEFRA produce their policy, on your submission, does anyone have to revisit the question and ask, what's that going to contribute to my overall assessment? The overarching judgment that is required by Section 13, and I accept on a continuing basis, um, operates in the context of the statutory time frame. So Section 14, um, well, the setting of budgets, carbon budgets, and then reporting on proposals and policies under Section 14 happens in a, a statutory time frame. In between those statutory time frames, it is a matter of judgment for the Secretary of State with overarching uh, control over net zero matters to determine whether or not a um, review uh, under Section 13 uh, is required. If that review is to be undertaken as a matter of judgment, uh, then that Secretary of State will have to be satisfied that the carbon budgets will be enabled to be met. In doing so, uh, those mandatory material considerations, as identified by Mr. S Justice Holday, will need to be taken into account. But there may be policies um, of an unquantified nature at that point that still exist, but nonetheless the overall judgment can be made that uh, the package is sufficient for the purposes of Section 13. It may be that you've just answered this question, um, in which case, forgive me. Um, but on this scenario, wh when might the Secretary of State be in default under the Section 13 duty? Um, if there is a uh, change that is sufficiently material to either require him to apply his uh, mind to whether or not he needs to carry out the whole economy exercise entailed in section 13 or he decides not to when the when the change is so material um, then a challenge may be made it would be on ordinary Wednesbury um, grounds um, it being ultimately a matter for the secretary of state Um, and so the key, the key point is that when looking to see whether carbon budgets are enabled to be met, it is that whole economy exercise. And the material considerations identified by Mr Justice Holgate go to that question of whether or not the whole package is sufficient. Because the risks, the delivery, and timescales quantification are the aids by which you identify whether the agglomeration of policies actually will deliver. Um, my learned friend took you to uh, paragraphs uh, 164 of in which uh, Mr. Justice Holgate identified five uh, points um, that were common ground in the context of the interpretation of section uh, 13. Um, and I don't um, seek to uh, repeat those. Um, but can I just point out paragraph 170, which is dealing with uh, the fifth point of agreement, which you can see at 168, 
which was whether or not the Secretary of State had to be uh, certain. And um, Mr. Justice Holgate said, um, enable should be given, this is paragraph 170, its ordinary meaning of to make possible or effective. Then he said this, here the emphasis is on policies which, taken overall, the Secretary of State judges will be effective or efficacious <coughs> for achieving the reduction set by the carbon um, budgets. And so that emphasises uh, the fact that it's the um, whole uh, economy assessment uh, that is required by section uh, 13. And my learned friend's gone to uh, paragraph 222, where um, Mr. Justice Holgate identifies what he has decided and, and, and what he hasn't. Um, and he says um, at the end of that paragraph on page 272 of the judgment itself. Um, no doubt the development of policy measures is kept under review by officials and by the Secretary of State, but my judgment does not address how often and when quantitative analysis might be required to be carried out. Such issues are essentially uh, matters of judgment for the defendant and his officials. And my submission is the uh, judgment's right in that. I, I may be wrong, so please help me with this. I, I thought the judge was there referring to where you have a policy measure, but you're reviewing it from time to time, which one understands is going to happen. But, but I think Mr. Wolf's primary focus is on where you simply signpost a policy now, but it's inchoate. Yes. There isn't actually anything there that can be evaluated yet. Um, what, what, what do you say is the duty of the Secretary of State in that situation? In that, in, in, in that situation, there, there, there are two things that are happening there. Uh, one, the publication of a policy by a, a particular Secretary of State. And two, the requirement on the Secretary of State, in practice, um, um, the Secretary of State for Energy Security and Net Zero now, um, to keep matters under review under Section 13.1 as a continuing uh, duty. Uh, the fact of publication does not create an obligation on the Secretary of State for Net Zero to uh, instigate a view at that point in time. He may choose to do so. That's where his judgment lies. So it's the Secretary of State's position um, that my learned friend's case goes too far when he says that um, his paragraph 39 of the skeleton argument effectively that whenever a material change to a package of proposals and policies between section 14 reports um, occurs, uh, the Secretary of State must ensure the package is sufficient to meet statutory purposes. There isn't that explicit language in the legislation, and it seeks, in my submission, to make mandatory what is essentially a matter um, of judgment, uh, especially so where there is an expectation of evolution. And the Secretary of State's um, expectation is that policies will evolve, and Mr. Justice Holgate. Um, identified that. These are policies that are directed towards 2050 and budgetary periods leading up to that, so over long uh, timescales, and policies that include um, reliance on innovation, and they will need to evolve in light of whether those innovations uh, come forward um, or not. Um, the consequences of um, the interpretation put forward by my, by my learned friend also need to be taken into account. So I say the language points to the Secretary of State's interpretation, the context does the same, and the consequences need to be taken into account. If the suggestion is that on the publication of a policy, the Secretary of State of a particular department, in this case DEFRA, needs to uh, carry out 
the Section 13 exercise. But only where it's been signposted in the net zero strategy. Indeed, but even so, um, the, that exercise by its nature is um, holistic and would be both burdensome, burdensome and have practical difficulties um, because the individuals um, who carry the information, knowledge and skill to carry out that exercise sit within the um, net zero directorate for the Department of Energy Security and uh, Net Zero, who specifically monitor in practice um, carbon budget compliance across the government uh, as a whole. And one could face situations where um, different conclusions could become, could be arrived at in different uh, departments. The legislation doesn't uh, set out any principles in relation to who should carry out uh, the Section 13 duty and when. It doesn't, for example, give carbon budgets to individual uh, departments, which it could have done. Um, in those circumstances, it would obviously be that Secretary of State that would be responsible uh, for it. But the route that has been taken by Parliament is one overarching carbon budget for the nation. What if, what if the um, Secretary of State with the Section 13 obligation believes that DEFRA are going to make a 10% contribution to achievement of the carbon budget, but the subsequent publication of the food strategy without any quantification or anything in it that identifies um, the 10%, leads the Secretary of State with the Section 13 obligation to worry about whether, whether indeed it is going to have yeah. that contribution. Uh, what, 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 what does the Section 13 obligation require when the food strategy is published? Well, it, it, if a strategy is published, like the food strategy, and the Secretary of State for Net Zero had been relying on it, and it created, as your ladyship said, a concern in that Secretary of State's mind, yeah. that might well engage the ongoing duty to, to um, look at the Section 13 um, uh, question of whether or not the package that he has in front of him will enable the carbon budgets to be made. So, so it might arise before, this, before the, the next five year? It, 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 it may well do. That, was, that will be a matter of judgment in the particular um, circumstances. And it, it, it was really as this an illustration of this point that I, I included in the bundle the carbon budget um, delivery uh, plan, not uh, as a deus ex machina to try and um, um, aid my case in relation to the impugned decision. This is clearly a document um, well published well after that. But may I just take your lordship just to show um, the. Uh, Section 13 duty and Section 14 in this case duty in, in practice as it's currently. We need the Prince of the Earth now. Uh, I have, thank you. So it's, this is in the uh, supplementary bundle at tab 17. Yeah. <coughs> and it was published at the end of uh, March. Of, uh, this year, and um, it stands as a Section 14 report and includes the Section 13 proposals and policies that are, are, are relied upon. And if I could take you to page 140 of the bundle, which is the introduction, and paragraph 3 um, says that the plan provides the detail setting out the current package of proposals and policies prepared by the Secretary of State as of March this year to enable the delivery of carbon budgets 4, 5 and 6. Um, and at 4, um, consistent with the duties imposed by the Climate Change Act 2008, uh, we will continue to keep the proposals and policies under review and update and amend uh, packages uh, as appropriate and at 5, noting they apply uh, the carbon budget supply to the uh, UK as a whole. Um, and then 
the uh, page 144 is a table, it's table 1, and it's total projected emissions. It, each of the substantive columns deals with a carbon uh, budgetary period, 4, 5, and 6, in the right-hand column. And you can see the years covered, um, the budget limit, so that is the carbon budget, carbon budget 6, 9, 6, 5 million tonnes of CAG equivalent. Um, the baseline uh, and then the savings required so it's the difference between the baseline and the budget that's been imposed and then residual emissions after uh, policy um, savings and you can see that in carbon budget 6 the negative figure of paragraph 18 a, uh, on the preceding page says where there's a positive figure, figure it indicates we expect to have reduced emissions beyond the level required, and where negative, further emission savings will be required. And um, one can see that playing out in, on page 148 of paragraph 30, uh, where it says uh, our quantified proposals and policies give us 100% of uh, carbon budget 4 or 5 and 97 of carbon budget 6. And then the judgment at um, 31 is um, confident car carbon budget 6, halfway down, uh, can be met. <clears throat> and what the rest of the, the documents from page 1153 one, uh, are tables <coughs> of the proposals and policies. And they're at 153, you can see there are three tables. Table four, policies captured in the energy and emissions projections. Um, they're in the baseline. Uh, table five are quantified proposals and policies, and table six, unquantified. And if one just looks at table five, firstly, on page 179, it begins. Um, one can see uh, the headings. So you, the policies are giving a number. I think there are 191 in Table 5. Uh, the sectors recorded, and then the policy, uh, its name and description, and then annual savings during each of the um, carbon budgetary periods are relevant, and the time scale on which it will take, a, take effect. And the uh, DEFRA uh, policies um, <coughs> begin on page uh, 89 of the, um, sorry, it's 222 of the uh, bundle itself, yeah. where you can see the first agriculture and LULUCF, which is land use, land use change in forestry. And at, at 150 is an example that I uh, pointed out in uh, my skeleton argument. Um, so on page 223, and the policy is use of methane suppressing feed products. And you can see that's um, quantified um, from uh, 2022. Uh, and that is a policy that was referred to in the food strategy. And I've given the references for that in my paragraph 20 of my uh, skeleton argument. I don't think I need to take, take you to the food strategy. And then similarly in my um, skeleton argument, I then uh, look at table six, which just for your note begins on page 239, table six being the unquantified proposals and policies. And as an example, uh, policy 77, which is on page 269, which relates to alternative proteins, and which again was referred to in the food strategy and the references for that in paragraph 21 of my skeleton argument. 
and, and this is really the, the process that would be required to happen on um, review of the Section 131 duty. Um, this information is the material, uh, mandatory material considerations identified by Mr. Holgate, Mr. Justice Holgate, um, being taken into account by the Secretary of State for uh, net zero. And that would be required if he was to undertake the Section 13 one duty at a point outside of the Section 14 uh, report. If he hadn't got that in a published document, he would need it. And the um, staff at the Directorate of Net Zero, as my learned friend identified, work with all the departments and would be seeking that information. And if that information wasn't provided, <coughs> the same track that um, Mr. Justice Holgate identified um, would be fallen into. Um, and, and so in my submission, that is information that would be required, but when the Section 13 one duty is being carried out, be that at a Section 14 report mm. or otherwise in between. My Lords, I think on um, Section 13, um, that is what I proposed to say. Um, there are a number of points I don't think your Lordships need to be troubled by that were answered in the response to the appellant's um, supplementary skeleton um, argument. Um, but for clarity, no change in defence is, is sought. And reliance on the uh, carbon budget delivery plan is only illustrative of how the Section 13 duty um, Operates. It is not sought as a defence to the decision in June. Right. So you don't seek to amend the defence. I don't seek that. No. Um, and in terms of the Secretary of State's approach to the second, the climate change advice ground, that is put forward uh, on the basis that it is contingent on the appellant succeeding on ground one. And that's as far as we rely, uh, our defence at the permission stage is that contingency point. And uh, we don't go further than that at this stage. Uh, unless there's any particular point um, you would like me to, to address, that's what I propose to say in response. Thank you. I'm reminded by my Lord that I perhaps ought to, and I think I ought to, um, ask you the same question as we asked of Mr. Wolfe, which was your position, should it be suggested that for good order at least, if not more than that, um, the other Secretary of State, as it were, should be added to the parties? There's, there's no uh, suggestion that in principle that is not open. Uh, to this court. Right. Uh, the Secretary of State's position was it wasn't necessary because this Secretary of State can answer for another Secretary of State. But if the court would be assisted by that, there's no objection in principle. Right, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Westminster. Thank you. Yes, um, Mr. Wolfe, you reply. My Lord, very briefly, uh, uh, I think I'll be very brief. Um, my Lord, Lord Justice Singh, my lady, lady Simler, asked questions about. Um, Signposting and the numbers, if you like. I can just, if I may, take you to um, two paragraphs of Mr. Justice Holgate's judgment. This is page 278, legal materials. First of all, <coughs> paragraph 131. Uh, I'm sorry, which paragraph? To, uh, paragraph 131. The, the, the advice given in the paragraph 10 of the ministerial submission was that the NZS package of proposals and policies credibly enables the UK to be on track for all the carbon budgets which have been set based upon A, current modelling, and B, quote, planned policy work to identify further options over the coming years to deliver 100%. Um, 
So that, that's the language that was used in the ministerial submission, just echoing the question that my Lord Lord Justice said. Lord. And then my Lady Justice uh, Simler's question about um, the, well, the gap, that to some extent is, appears in the table, which is in paragraph 128 but runs over the page. And if you look at the last, the last row of that table, the further capability from NZS pathways, and that's a slightly cryptic language to say you'll get, you'll get the rest from, from other stuff. And, I think, and those two things sit together. So the gap was being filled by future policies and proposals, and that's the signposting point. Um, just on the statutory language point, the, the, the obligation in section 13 is to prepare plans and proposals. So the actual verb, as it were, is prepare plans and proposals. That's the Section 13 obligation. The outcome of that is some assessment of will enable. So one can, I can analyse it as two steps, if you like, or, or whatever, but the underlying continuing obligation is in the preparation of policies and proposals. We say that's the exercise that takes place here in multiple ways. Let me just look at that in the context of the way my learned friend explains what he says should happen. As I understand his submission, he effectively says that, that the net zero strategy could signpost the food strategy, which could be prepared as a policy or proposal by the Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. But that wasn't a Section 13 exercise, even though it was obviously the preparation. It was in terms of at what was happening. The exercise, he says, only bites at the subsequent stage of the, the, the SENS, somehow pulling them all together and putting numbers on them. Now, if that, and then adding up the numbers to make it 100% or not. Now, if that's right, we get the bizarre situation in, in which you get a policy or proposal like this one published in the gap between the, the, the overall exercise being undertaken without the information which it's recognised will be needed at some point in the future. And on my learned friend's case, that's when the Secretary of State for environment uh, for, 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 for net zero decides in his discretion to pull the exercise together. Um, so it creates exactly the problem he seeks to avoid, which is you publish a food strategy, and then at some point later on, it's quantified and the delivery risk is assessed and it's put into the mix, potentially by somebody else on his case, which could be several years down the track. This exercise has to, the section 14 exercise, and therefore by extension the section 13 exercise, has to be done at least every six years. That's the carbon budget cycle. But on my learned friend's case, we could have the food strategy that was published in uh, 2022 only being having got numbers on it and so on some years down the line. Now, as it happens, we've got a carbon delivery uh, plan which has followed a year from the net zero strategy, but that's only because Mr Justice Holgate crossed it in the first place. So, so um, opportunistically, if you like, that's happened a year later. But on my learned friend's case, it could have been five years before the Secretary of State for the uh, Net Zero woke up and said, I, things have changed enough for me to now pull the numbers together. By which point, the food strategy would be several years out of date. That can't be, in our submission, what Section 13 is talking about. But on your submission, does it follow that it's sec the Secretary of State for Zens who has to prepare the food strategy? No, I don't think it does. Well, if you've emphasised the word must prepare such proposal, and the relevant proposal is the development of the food strategy. Then, then why doesn't it follow that? Be, be, because that's that's um, uh, if I say so to mistakenly say that it's only the Secretary of State for, for net zero who discharges the Section 13 obligation in its toto. Yes, I see. And and and, and uh, for interpretation acts and so on, we know it can be any of them. It's the individual right. government. So, so 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 to some extent, at least, your argument may turn on the meaning of Secretary of State. Um. Well, um, y yes. I mean, if, if, if my learned friend is right, and the and it's only the Secretary of State for uh, 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 net zero mm -hmm. who can do this job, then then it may well be that um, at the point the food strategy comes out, the the DEFRA civil servants are doing the, the heavy lifting. The DEFRA Secretary of State signs off the document for DEFRA policy purposes, and the net zero Secretary of State needs to um, sign it off for Section 13 purposes. So be it. I mean, that, that, um, we're not trying to dictate the mechanics of government, I, I hope. Um, I, I'm not sure that's, um, um, uh, just then, in terms of the carbon budget delivery plan points, I mean, my learned friend floats it as an example of how it can be done. Can I just um, remind you of a couple of points in, in, in his skeleton? We, we, first of all, you've seen, we, we, we query its admissibility in these proceedings. 
is backtracked on what its role is, but we query its, its relevance here because it's not said to render the food strategy academic. It's not said to um, somehow um, make this claim go away. Um, and indeed, very clearly, the food strategy remains the government's food strategy and its legality to be tested at the time it was made. Um, the other point, not therefore particularly relevant to that, but just contextually, is that the CBDP itself is now subject to a legal challenge. So whatever one view one took of it, it too is now um, subject to a legal challenge. So, so, so no great reliance can be placed on it. In, what in what stage has that challenge got to? Uh, it was only just been commenced, my lady. Just been commenced. Um, right, so it hasn't reached a permission decision. Oh, no, no, it's a long way from that. I mean, the, 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 the CBDP itself was only 30th of March. But a claim has been issued. A claim has been issued. Um, so, so, my lord and lady, we, we say um, it is, just skip to the JR threshold if I may, it is plainly arguable that, that in producing the food strategy in June 2022, let me say one or other <laughs> Secretary of State um, acted unlawfully in relation to the Section 13 obligation um, and I agree parasitically on that, but nonetheless significantly because it matters to the content of the question failed to discharge the Wyatt obligations in relation to it. We say that's at least arguable. It's also plainly a point of wider public importance because it arises not just in other live judicial reviews, but also will arise again because the structure that we've canvassed this morning of signposting, we called it that for ease of use, um, plainly is one that will, will or could be replicated in future uh, conversations. So we invite the court to grant judicial review permission. As we've discussed, we invite the court to retain that um, matter for its own consideration. We are entirely relaxed. We, we see the sense of inviting the other Secretary of State or ordering the other Secretary of State should be a party to those proceedings um, for good order or whatever it may be. Um, uh, I'm not told there's anything else I need to say, so for, that, for those purposes, those are our submissions. Mr. Westman and Smith, we're going to rise for a short time.
Having heard oral argument this morning on ground five, we have reached the conclusion uh, that the application before us should succeed to the extent that we have decided to grant permission to apply for judicial review on that ground, uh, so that the matters raised can be fully debated before the court. We are conscious of the importance of the issue lying behind uh, the claim and its potentially wide ramifications, not only in this case, uh, but in others currently proceeding before the courts. The issue of climate change itself and the steps to be taken to achieve net zero are in themselves matters of public interest. We consider it likely that full legal argument on the issues in the proceedings is likely to take more than the half day allocated to this hearing. We shall return to that in a moment. Under CPR 5261, there are two bases upon which this court has power to grant permission to appeal. They are that the appeal has a real prospect of success, or that there is a compelling reason why an appeal should be heard. Uh, we have decided to grant permission to apply for judicial review, uh, having in mind that the case does raise questions of considerable general importance, which we think should in any event be finally decided after full argument. We bear in mind that the decision um, against which the claimant brings these uh, proceedings um, or, uh, bring, brings this application was itself a decision that permission to bring a claim for judicial review should be refused. And we have in mind, of course, that the test for the grant of such permission sets a relatively low threshold, namely whether the grounds are properly arguable not whether they will in due course succeed. We have concluded in the light of the submissions made to us that the grounds before us are properly arguable. In these circumstances we have concluded that we should say very little about the merits of the arguments. Under CPR 5285, this court has the power in circumstances such as these to grant permission to apply for judicial review rather than permission to appeal. Accordingly, we grant permission to apply for judicial review on ground five uh, and on the reformulated ground which is contingent on the success of that ground. Under CPR 5286, we reserve the hearing of the claim for judicial review for the Court of Appeal. We shall allow the parties time to agree appropriate directions, but we indicate now that for good order, it seems to us clear that the Secretary of State for Energy Security and Net Zero should be added as a defendant, and that the directions should embrace an order to that We do not consider that there is any justification at this stage for, for any application for specific disclosure, as was intimated at least at one stage by the applicant. Now what we propose to do, rather than seek to formulate the directions here and now, is to give the parties the opportunity to go away and formulate those directions for us, please, uh, in the form of a draft order. Um, we shall then review that, make any appropriate adjustments, and issue the directions formally to you. Is there anything else that we ought to be dealing with at this stage? Um, well, uh, only the question, I think you sort of signed for it, hinted at this uh, a moment ago, of, of, of listing of um, time estimates and possibly whether you want to say anything about, in your order, about um, mm. timetable for listing itself. Because um, yeah. I know if without that, then we can get into discussion. Um, yes. With the court office. Well, subject to what 
Let me just let me just speak to my colleagues about this. It seems to us, having thought about this briefly just now, and subject to anything that's said um, by yourselves, that the case ought to be listed for hearing um, for a day and a half uh, in the early part of next term, that is to say the Michaelmas term. Well, that, that's um, very adventitious because we were discussing the matter at the same time as you were, and we too came to a came to the same view. <laughs> Uh, we well should have done that beforehand. I realised that immediately. That's, you know, that's, a, that's anyway. a happy consent. That's a happy consent. So, so um, that does seem to us to be appropriate. Did you agree on the time estimate as well as? Uh, the, yes, exactly. Day and a half. Yeah. On the um, and, and I think the, the, the defendant wants um, they want to put in evidence, so they need the time that is consistent with that um, process. So it couldn't realistically be much quicker unless no. we really speed no, it up. I think that's right, and that's the view we've taken about it. So the order will contain those directions then, a day and a half hearing to be listed in the early part of the Michaelmas term. We'll, we'll come back to you with the draft. Does, does that give you all the indications you need from us at this stage? Thank you. It, it does, thank you. Right, well, thank you both. There's nothing else at this stage. No. No. Well, we thank you all. Um, when I say all, I mean not just the advocates, as it were, up front, but those who assisted them. Um, 